So now it is, uh, it is time to, to let, kick off the summit. And uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the cornerstone to this meeting is uh, our two keynote speakers. They're both internationally recognized experts in the field of public health and childhood obesity. We are ecstatic that they're both here. Uh, it's been great to spend time with them uh, over the past day and, and uh, communicating with them up to uh, this summit. And not only are they brilliant, but they are incredibly kind and generous people. And you can't say that a lot about it, uh, about that many people. And so a uh, thank you to both of our keynote speakers. Um, our keynote speaker for today is Dr. Jim Salas. And um, excuse me while I pull out my notes because there's a long, he's got a long CV. Uh, Jim Salas is, the, is a distinguished professor emeritus of family medicine and public health at the University of California, San Diego. He's a professional fellow at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he recently was awarded the Elizabeth Fries Health Education Award by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Foundation, and this is to uh, really recognized him for a career of doing pioneering work in the area of the socio-ecological environment and health. Um, he is, uh, he was the uh, director of the Acting Living Research Program at the Robert Wood Foundation. Um, he Let's see, he created the award-winning uh, Sports P Play and Active Recreation for Kids. You probably know it as SPARK. Uh, SPARK has uh, led to increased physical activity of more than 1.5 million kids uh, at schools across the country. He has launched the uh, IPEN, International Physical Activity Environment Network. Uh, he's in that's in approximately 20 countries. And he is the author of more than 700 uh, scholar, scholarly articles. His um, one metric that academics use to gauge uh, productivity is this thing called an H index, and he's got the highest that I've ever seen uh, for uh, a researcher. And so uh, it is my, uh, my privilege to welcome uh, Dr. Jim Salas for uh, our keynote presentation. Thanks, Robin. Appreciate that. And um... You know, when you get a standing ovation at the beginning, maybe you're better off just sitting down and, and uh, <laughs> leaving it at that, or leave well enough alone. Um, so I, I thank Robin for uh, inviting me and organizing this, and um, for adopting standing ovations, which we, we uh, call active applause. So, uh, and we invite everybody to take that, take that and use that um, uh, in your own meetings. Uh, so, um, uh, I'm going to talk about ecological approaches to promoting active living and preventing childhood obesity. Um, uh, you'll get other, uh, other information uh, today on healthy eating, so I'm not going to emphasize that too much. Um, so uh, let's, just, uh, let's just get going here. Uh, disclosures, uh, some, uh, some places want you to do this, Spark programs, and I've had a tiny amount of money from this architecture firm, not nearly enough. So, uh, so what I'm going to do today uh, is I'm not going to talk about the problem. I uh, figure you're here, uh, you're already committed to uh, working on childhood obesity, I'm not going to tell you that it's bad. Um, uh, the, the captain gave you a little bit of information about that. But I'm, I'm going to start with ecological models or how we think about solutions um, to this problem and uh, then uh, go over uh, a tip of the iceberg of evidence about um, what kinds of environments uh, promote uh, low activity and then higher activity, uh, um, uh, evidence of the environment roles in youth obesity. I've got some new data um, to uh, share with you. Uh, I wanna uh, talk very briefly about environmental disparities um, because uh, uh, some people don't have as many opportunities, especially for activity, uh, as others. So I want to uh, touch on that and encourage you uh, to work on that, uh, uh, maybe even more uh, than you're doing now. Uh, one point I want to make um, uh, that I'll alert you to is that uh, should be obvious by now, people working in the field, there's no single solution 
to childhood obesity or getting kids active. Um, we have to do a combination of things. So I want to show you some evidence that uh, really confirms that. Um, and then uh, uh, I want to leave some time for discussion um, and think about together how can we use this evidence to be more effective in preventing childhood obesity. Um, my, uh, I'm, a, I'm a researcher, that's what I've been all my career, but uh, my hope is that I can be part of research that makes a difference, uh, that uh, leads to some actionable solutions. So, um, so let's, let's talk about action uh, at the end. Um, okay, one, uh, just one illustration uh, here. Um, this is global, globally, based on self-reports, more than 80% of adolescents do not meet physical activity guidelines, which are um, an hour or more a day. 80% don't meet these guidelines, even by self-report. Um, and in the U.S., there's, uh, there's plenty of kids uh, um, in the U.S. Um, uh, that uh, don't meet these guidelines. Um, and just to put, it, put our situation in perspective, um, there's uh, about 10 countries that used accelerometers um, uh, to objectively measure uh, physical activity in adolescents. Um, and uh, most, of them are, uh, uh, most of them are European uh, countries uh, with, a, with Brazil and a couple of others there. Um, and, as, and so and only in these countries can we compare uh, how active kids are in one country versus another. And I, I circled um, uh, the, the lowest number here, which happens to be in the United States. Um, and uh, the average here was uh, about 45 minutes, which is clearly less than 60 minutes. Um, and um, you can compare that to um, uh, the, the highest country, which is here, 80, 84 minutes in Norway. So uh, according to these, uh, these results, Norwegian adolescents are getting almost double uh, the amount of physical activity that uh, our adolescents are here in the US. So that's just to put our problem here in perspective. Um, we're, we're not only doing poorly with getting kids active, we're doing uh, among the worst in the world, uh, according to the evidence that we have. So uh, this, is, this is kind of the, a very simple model of what, what, what's going on. Um, and uh, I like to start, start from the right. So what's causing sickness, death, and healthcare costs? Well, it's obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, chronic diseases. Um, we're talking about obesity today. And uh, the, the, all of these chronic diseases come from uh, a common, uh, common set of uh, factors, behaviors, diet, physical activity, and sedentary time. And where, but the key question, um, the question that will connect us with solutions is what's leading to those, those behaviors, to those causes. And um, most of us are health professionals. How many of you are here are a health professional of one type or another? Maybe not a clinician, but most everybody. Okay. Most of us, I'm a psychologist. And so I was taught um, that behavior is influenced by uh, thoughts, emotions, uh, biology, things within the person. In, in medical school, and nursing school, it's all about the body, what's inside the body. And so we focus on genes, biology, and psychology. And, and most of us were never taught, well, what's going on outside the body? What's going on in the world um, that might uh, influence health? Um, and and uh, I consider that a big uh, hole gap and flaw in my education, and I consider it a similar flaw in medical education, because we're only thinking about what's inside. So we start thinking about what's outside, and the environments, the policies, and what's happening in society. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on today, um, to try, I, I think of this as remedial work, um, and I'm going to uh, hopefully convince you that what's going on in environments and policies and society um, makes a difference and is something that we need, things that we need to work on. Okay. Um, and so there are actually uh, 
practical policy reasons um, to do environment and policy research, which we haven't actually been doing for too long. Because the, the National Academy of Medicine, the CDC, the Surgeon General, the Heart Association, the World Health Organization, the National Physical Activity Plan, and many, many other groups recommend policy changes and environmental changes as essential for improving activity, diet, and obesity. Um, and there are policy initiatives with the intent to change physical activity and obesity occurring in governments, um, school districts, um, and, uh, uh, and industry. Um, and many of you represent those, those actions. Um, and uh, when uh, the concern about childhood obesity really uh, came to um, national prominence about the turn of the millennium, we, we didn't have any, uh, hardly any research on any of these things. And so um, uh, evidence is needed for, uh, as the basis for this work. And uh, uh, I've certainly been working on this kind of evidence for 20 years or more. And uh, the good news I'm going to bring you is we have lots of evidence uh, that we can act on now. And that's, that's where I want to start now. Um, so here are two. United States postage stamps um, that, to me, um, are uh, unfortunately celebrating um, uh, policies and environments that are now killing a lot of Americans. And uh, so, from a physical activity point of view, um, this, uh, these two stamps are a recipe for how we can eliminate um, uh, active transportation or eliminate, or almost eliminate, walking or biking to get from place to place. So, um, uh, so that's a active transportation. That's one of the domains of physical activity. So how do we do it? How do we, how do, we do this? Well, the first thing we do is we enact zoning laws that, um, that separate the uses of land. So we put houses here, the residential subdivisions, that look nice from the air. Um, and we put um, uh, uh, businesses and shops somewhere else, and then we put office parks somewhere else, and then we put schools somewhere else. So when you separate all the places that you might want to go, it means that you can't walk to and from those places. Um, so um, we drive, and we do that. And, and so to make sure, so that's one of the recipes, make things too far to walk or too far to bike. Um, and then um, in case some, some places are, are close enough to walk and bike, you want to create a transportation system that creates further barriers to walking and biking. And uh, just the, the, of course, the epitome of our transportation system uh, are these uh, highway, freeway, uh, expressway um, uh, uh, systems uh, that we've spent really billions and trillions of dollars building. And you might not be familiar with the goal of transportation uh, policy in the United States. It's very, very simple. Um, the goal of transportation in the United States can be stated as move as many cars as fast as possible. So what is, what is the priority of bicycling there, or of walking, or of public transit? It's not there. It's moving cars. And so if you want to move cars, this is the best way we figured out how to do it. Um, and uh, so um, two, two things about this. One is, uh, I'm not sure when they took this picture. Have you ever seen an interchange like this with so few cars? I don't think that's reality. I think they must have photoshopped that. Um, the second thing, this is the, the ultimate in American transportation. And, uh, and by law, pedestrians and bicyclists are prohibited from using it. So think about all of the, all of the money that we have spent to put things far, too far away for walking and biking, and then to create transportation systems that literally uh, uh, block um, walking and biking. And I, I bring this up because, uh, you know, I started out with transportation because it's, um, uh, we have ways of getting around that have worked for us for several million years 
And uh, it's, a, it's a, a technology that we call feet. Um, that now, uh, we said, well, we got newer technology. We've got better technology. So let's go all in on, on driving. And in the, in the 1930s and 40s, that seemed like a good idea. Now, um, we, we know that this is a recipe for traffic congestion and also pollution and also greenhouse gas uh, generation uh, and also um, uh, 40,000 deaths per year uh, from crashes. Um, and uh, contributing to inactivity and obesity. So, uh, so, um, so that's one of the, just one of the ways that we've um, created uh, unhealthy environments. I, I want to just give uh, um, a, a little parallel information or a vi visuals about our food environments. And none of this will come as a surprise. Um, but many environments encourage overeating. Um, this, this picture I took uh, several years ago at a Disney resort in Florida. And I'm thinking, what is the marketing genius behind um, calling a cafeteria Tubby's and advertising it with an obese kid? I just did not understand that. Um, but somebody thought, yeah, this is, this is going to make people want to come and, 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 uh, and go to Tubby's. Um, and take your kid there. And I think we would now uh, uh, understand that's not a good idea. Okay, and then we have the general um, food environment in the United States dominated by um, unhealthy food and lots of it in big portions and um, uh, ubiquitous everywhere. And, uh, and this, this is the kind of uh, food environment that we see everywhere across the U.S not helping us eat better. And, and this is um, a celebration of the, the, the most unhealthy food environment that you can create. Um, not, not surprisingly, this was at a, uh, uh, at a fair. Uh, and uh, the Heart Attack Cafe. And if we'll, we'll, you bring it, we'll fry it. And, and celebrating, we got the triple bypass, we got the heart stopper, we got the big one, we got the flat liner, and we got the nurse on duty in, in case you, uh, you fall over. So the celebration of unhealthy food environments is, uh, um, should be a bit disturbing to us, but it's certainly part of the American culture that we have to deal with. Okay. Um, and of course, we'd like to see more of this. We'd like to see more featuring and celebration of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and you can, you can find that in some places, but not everywhere, that's for sure. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of food environment we want to work toward. Um, so anyway, uh, I told you we're going we're gonna, to uh, focus on ecological models. And uh, that's what we have here. But as, as a psychologist and as health professionals, we're taught to, to focus on individuals and the social environment. And, um, and we've, uh, in our models that we were taught, uh, certainly in, in health behavior, we were, uh, we said, well, uh, we were taught this is what influences behavior. So you don't need to worry about anything else. You don't need to worry about the physical environment. You don't need to worry about the policy context. Don't think about that. Don't include that. So I think that our models have really retarded our progress in uh, dealing with chronic diseases in general. Um, and so, um, uh, so we've been uh, uh, researching these other factors, the environment and policy, um, uh, for the past 20 years. And the, the uh, promise, the reason for doing that is um, when you change an environment, you put a park in a neighborhood, or you change a policy, um, you require um, quality physical education in schools, then those, those changes um, reach everybody in those neighborhoods or in those schools, not just volunteers to a program who want to come exercise more. And um, uh, that park is going to be permanent. And uh, so uh, that... Uh, uh, that complements the individual approaches, which tend to not reach that many people, like 
program, signing up for a program, um, and the people that participate in those programs um, can change and do change, but uh, usually those changes are modest. Um, and um, the people that do change, um, many of them will um, uh, not maintain those changes. So, uh, so working with individuals, we now understand as a field, is not, cannot be a full solution. And the idea of, of uh, and, and so there's uh, some principles uh, of ecological models that, uh, um, that I, wanna, I, I want to uh, mention now. And so one, the most important one, I think, is that the most effective interventions operate at multiple levels. So uh, what we really want to do is um, change environments and policies so they make it easier for people to make healthy choices. Um, uh, just because you've got a park doesn't mean people are going to go to it. But, um, but if you don't have a park, it means people can't go to it. Right? So environments and policies can make a healthy choice easier. And then we want to educate and motivate people to use those opportunities. But if there are no opportunities, if they don't have healthy food in their neighborhoods, or their school doesn't serve healthy food, how are they going to make a healthy choice? So, um, so these two need to work together, but the opportunities and the environments, I think, need to be there first. And we also are learning that environment and policy strategies are specific to the behavior. Um, so if we create, uh, if we build a walkable a city uh, or neighborhood where people can walk from their home to, uh, to shopping, um, that, that's good for active transportation. But it may not be sufficient to help people get good leisure activity because maybe you need a park, or you need a, a, a YMCA, or, or uh, some other facility like that. So you've got to, um, and if you want people to eat fruits and vegetables, you need fruits and vegetables in the environment. Um, so uh, the, the environments and the policies are really specific to the behavior. Uh, and there can be multiple levels of environmental influences that I will, that I will show you. Um, so at the macro level, at the overall community level, we look at the design of the city. Is it walkable? Can people walk to destinations? Are there parks? Um, are there healthy food outlets? And, are, uh, and um, how far are they? But then you can zoom in um, at the micro uh, level um, and not up above to see what things look like and where they are, but you know, get into the community what do the streetscapes look like? Um, do the parks have any uh, facilities for physical activity in them? Are, in, are they in good condition? And in, the, in a food, uh, uh, food store or restaurant, we want to look at, well, what, how many uh, healthy food options are there? What are the prices? What are the promotions um, that are going on uh, that will uh, affect people's uh, decision making? So that's, those are the kind of things that we're, we're interested in with ecological models. And I just want to show you this, not for the specifics, but to show this is an ecological model of active living. Um, and what we find is there are different environment and policy drivers of the different domains of activity, of recreation, household activity, active transportation, and occupational activities, or school. Uh, activities for children, that we have to think of each of those settings and each of, the do each of those domains uh, specifically. Um, so um, and, uh, so uh, this is just a, uh, an idea, a, a sample of active recreation. We look at the neighborhood. Are there p uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities? What about the aesthetics? We actually find that the aesthetics matter. Uh, for people uh, doing leisure activity. And what about traffic safety? And when we, let's look at recreation environments. Is there uh, activity equipment in the home? Are there parks and trails? Are there uh, private recreation facilities? Are there sports? And then policies, we can look at healthcare policies. Are um, uh, healthcare providers promoting, uh, encouraging uh, leisure activity? Zoning codes. Uh, that affect and development recreations that affect uh, uh, the, the pedestrian facilities, the aesthetics, uh, the transportation investments, and the public 
recreation investments. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot of potential, um, and uh, just fixing one of those things is probably not going to be enough. We need to create a really supportive environment. Here is a, uh, a similar um, ecological framework for influences on eating behavior. Um, so we've got individual factors um, that tend to uh, be common across behaviors, um, uh, social environments, uh, for example, uh, family, friends, and peers, um, a lot of physical environments, the food at home, work site, school, childcare, um, restaurants, supermarkets, and, um, and then the, the macro level. Um, uh, cultural uh, norms and values, uh, food, the food and beverage industry, huge, uh, huge influence, um, agricultural policies. So these are the, the range of things, and, and I'm sure many of you are working on uh, some and, and perhaps all of these things, but I just wanted to give you an overview. If, if we want to create a healthier um, uh, environment for children's uh, food and physical activity, we need to be thinking about all of those things. And uh, um, uh, here's a, an illustration. Um, when we only intervene with individuals, um, we're basically in, in, a, in a hostile environment where a healthy food is hard to find and it's unsafe uh, to be active in a lot of places. You have to be really strong and determined um, to, to pursue healthy behavior. Um, and if we're only working with individuals, we're trying to get them strong um, and, and to take individual responsibility um, in the face of many community barriers. The alternative is to make the barriers less, to lower the barriers, to make a healthier environment, um, healthier community, um, and then uh, it's easier for the individual to make those healthy behaviors. Okay, so uh, now a little bit of evidence. At the, at, and this is gonna focus really on physical activity. And I'm gonna start at the macro level. And, and uh, uh, what I'm gonna show you here is cities can be designed to move people or to move cars. So we're, we're looking at the, the cities from above. And so everybody knows what this is, right? New York City. New York City. Um, most walkable uh, neighborhood in America the least obese neighborhood in America. Um, and it's got, it's got leisure activity with the beautiful uh, uh, Central Park. Um, it's a walkable neighborhood. What does that mean? It means that it's mixed use. There are residences and stores and offices and schools scattered everywhere. You have many options that you can walk to. You, uh, you never know what you're gonna find. The streets are connected, the famous New York City grid of streets and avenues. So you can walk uh, any different direction. You have many um, ways that you can go. And of course, it's very dense, all right? So that supports um, uh, shopping near where people live. Uh, there's enough people living there that can walk there uh, to keep shops open. So that's one way. And all cities were built like this up until um, the early 20th century. Before cars, all cities had to be walkable because that was your only option, unless it was a horse or a bicycle. Uh, but now, we have, we have other, other things that we can do. We can create a city for cars. And you can see, look at this. I mean, what's front and center uh, here is, is this big uh, expressway. And then you've got low density, you've got disconnected streets. How do you go from here to here? Um, uh, very, very difficult. And um, uh, so it looks nice from above, but once you get down in it, you say, well, I got to drive. Um, and um, so uh, I, I, won't, I won't bother the, the, the game of having you guess where this is because you would never guess where it is. A lot of people guess, well, that looks like San Diego. I say, yeah, it does look like San Diego. It looks very much like San Diego, um, but it's not. Um, and it's not even in the United States. And I use this picture um, because it shows that the, in, the unhealthy environments that we have pioneered and somewhat perfected in the United States, we are now exporting all over the world. And this is Cape Town, South Africa. 
right? Looks like it could be anywhere in the US. But no, uh, it's Cape Town, South Africa, and um, these, uh, uh, this kind of city design works just the same there as it does here. Uh, it's very effective at creating traffic congestion and unhealthy behaviors, all right? And so they're, they're dealing with that too. So when we think of an active city, how, would, how do we design an active city? We think of these five settings, uh, parks, the overall city design, transportation, schools, and then buildings and workplaces. But, um, so we, we know now, we have evidence that all of the design of all of these places um, affects health. And I'll show you a little bit of evidence. Um, but um, the public health and health professionals are not responsible for designing any of these, okay? So when, when these places are designed, health professionals are not at the table. Uh, health may or may not be one of the, the goals. And uh, so, so you find a lot of decisions made where health is not considered, but uh, health, uh, uh, health systems has to clean up the mess um, that are, uh, that are uh, created uh, by unhealthy design. And so that means um, that's why we have to partner. And that's why we have meetings like this um, that go beyond the health professions. So how many of you are not a health professional. You're in some other, um, some other field. Oh, that's fantastic. We will maybe, let's talk about that at the, at the discussion. And so we need to work with uh, planners to make sure neighborhoods are designed to be healthy. We gotta work with transportation engineers and planners. We gotta work with parks and rec professionals and landscape architects. And we need to work with uh, educators for schools and architects. Uh, okay, so I'm going to uh, just show you a little bit of evidence now. How do these things matter for, uh, for youth uh, and activity and obesity? So here's a, a, um, uh, a study that was recently published. We call it our teen study, teen environment and neighborhood. And uh, uh, so um, this was just published this year in Preventive Medicine. And um, so we... Um, uh, recruited adolescents age 12 to 16 from uh, 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 four types of neighborhoods. Um, we had high walkable and low walkable neighborhoods, um, and within those we had high income and low income, because we were interested in uh, examining the uh, environmental disparities. Um, so that, that created a two by two table, or four types of neighborhoods. Uh, we recruited them by uh, phone and mail. We had uh, a little over 900 um, of these adolescents and uh, their parents uh, involved in the study. And I'm just going to go right to the results. Uh, this is accelerometer, uh, uh, physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes per day by the four types of neighborhoods. And the green is the high walkable. And you can see that for both low income and high income, uh, kids were more active in the high walkable uh, neighborhoods. And the difference is like uh, five to uh, seven minutes a day. And uh, this is exactly what we found um, in our study of adults, a similar study of adults. Oh, and I should say that um, these uh, kids were recruited from Seattle and King County, Washington, and uh, um, uh, parts of uh, Maryland, including, including Baltimore. Um, so, um, uh, actually, five to seven minutes objectively measured uh, physical activity is pretty substantial um, uh, because it, remember, it applies to everybody in the neighborhood and it applies as long as they live in that neighborhood. Um, active transportation to school, um, uh, you can see uh, also higher, as we would expect in the high walkable neighborhoods. Um, uh, uh, minutes of watching uh, a screen time, basically uh, screen time. This was, uh, uh, there was a walkability difference um, with the people, uh, the kids in the low walkable um, neighborhoods watching uh, uh, TV and uh, screens more. Uh, it was also significant for income. So you can see that uh, the lower income adolescents are, are, uh, have more screen time, more sedentary time. Um, I will say that 
um, uh, BMI or obesity rates were not different by neighborhood uh, in, in that study. Okay, but, uh, but uh, we can see, um, we, and so we now have data just from our own studies and of course many others that uh, people have more total physical activity if they live in a, a walkable uh, neighborhood and that applies to um, uh, older adults, to younger adults, to adolescents, and to children. Um, so now, um, let me show you another, uh, another study. Um, this one's called NIC, Neighborhood Impact on Kids. Uh, this is a study of six to 10 year olds and their parents in King, Seattle and King County, Washington, in San Diego. Um, and um, uh, this study uh, was led by Brian Salins, who's in Seattle, and um, uh, it's, it's going to appear in uh, obesity uh, pretty soon, uh, I think later this summer. And uh, we just learned that they're going to do a, a press release on this. So uh, please take a, uh, take a look at that. And so uh, the design of this one was a bit different. Um, we we um, uh, selected kids um, from, f uh, again, four types of neighborhoods, but they were defined differently. So we, we looked at what we call high and low physical activity environment. So a, a good physical activity environment is walkable has a, uh, ha and has a, a good park um, available. Um, a low physical uh, activity environment was not walkable and had no, no park. And then we looked at high and low nutrition environment. So a good nutrition environment um, would have um, uh, a supermarket nearby and not too many fast food restaurants. A poor nutrition environment would have no supermarket and lots of fast food. And so we then uh, created these, uh, uh, these four types of neighborhoods. And um, this, uh, this study uh, was a two-year prospective study. We had a, almost 700 kids at the beginning and a little over 600 two years later. Um, uh, uh, and uh, about 16% Hispanic, uh, uh, not, not too many uh, African Americans, unfortunately, but 11% uh, multiracial. Uh, Here are the baseline results. Um, and uh, for, you see the same pattern for both overweight, percent overweight, and percent obese. The highest percent uh, overweight and obese was in the yellow, poor for physical activity, poor for uh, nutrition. The, the best or the least obesity was seen with a bit good physical activity environment, good nutrition environment. And you see that both, both are important. Um, so it's a big difference between 19% obesity and 12% obesity. That's a big difference. Um, and, and so uh, the, the paper that's going to be published now is um, looking at uh, the two-year changes. And so this is the two-year changes in the shift from being uh, shift to uh, being not overweight. So this is from uh, kids who were overweight or obese at the beginning and not overweight or obese. So in the, in the best neighborhoods, 32% of the previous overweight or obese were no longer in that category over just two years. And, um, and so 11% uh, improved if they were in the, in, the, in the worst neighborhoods. And you see uh, the ones in the middle uh, there as well. So I think that's very encouraging. Just living in a health-promoting neighborhood um, can help kids uh, overcome uh, overweight and obesity. Um, and the other one is these are kids who became overweight or obese. Um, so they were a healthy weight at the beginning. And you see the, the lowest rate there is in the, the healthiest neighborhoods. And um, we would have probably expected this, the worst neighborhoods, to be higher, um, but we, uh, we didn't quite see that, okay? But the lowest, um, the, the least progression to uh, overweight or obesity was in the, the healthiest neighborhoods, okay? Um, so that's the, the macro level. Let's look at the, the micro level. Um, let's go down to street level. Um, okay, um, again, you can design for cars or you can design for people, and they look different. 
And so if you're designing for cars, this is a great design. Because if you want a lot of cars to go fast, then you have, you have wide roads, you have no, nothing in their way, you have very few stop signs, stop lights or anything, and you don't have anything right next to the road to distract the drivers. You want them to focus on the road and barrel down that road and get to where they're going. Um, the only, only problem with that is if you want to buck the trend and you want to walk. Look at this fella. All right? So there's nothing for a pedestrian, nothing at all. No sidewalk, no nothing. He, he just went to his doctor. His doctor said, you need to get out and walk. He's trying to do that. Uh, if he survives, do you think he would want to do that again in that location? I don't think so. And so, and so where, where do we find this, this kind of um, design of streets? Everywhere. Every, this defines America, right? Everything for cars, nothing for people. And so if we wanted to design a place where people not only could walk without getting run over, but might even want to walk, it might look more like this. Put yourself in this uh, picture and think about how that would be to walk. Okay, you've got uh, the streets are narrower, the cars are going to go slower, you've got nice sidewalks, and look at this, as a pedestrian up on top, what do you have to look at? Well, you can look at parking lots or cars. Really exciting. Um, and here, you've got, you've got a, just a line of one store after another. You never know what's gonna, what you're going to see in the next second. It's much more interesting, better for your brain. And, um, and, and look at this, they went the extra mile to put in the trees to make the aesthetics nice so you, you feel good walking there. So, um, so that's a whole different thing. So, um, um, let, so we, we uh, 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 developed a, a scale, uh, or an observational measure, to actually quantify these differences. And we call this MAPS. Um, and I'm going to, and here's a, a summary of results. Um, we started out with a, a 120 items that we were looking at um, as we were walking down the street. Uh, so that's good for research, but it's too much for other people. So we, um, we uh, cut that down to 15 items, which uh, you see here. So we call this the MAPS Mini. Um, and, uh, and so here are, the, here are the items. And then uh, what these, and so then we have columns for children, adolescents, adults, and uh, seniors. And uh, where there's a box, um, it means there's a, um, a significant association our correlation between um, that MAPS item or scale and walking for transportation. And so, um, and the darker the um, uh, uh, box, the stronger the association. And so, um, uh, you can see that uh, the, the ones that I put in red here, the items in red are uh, ha are significant in three groups. So street lights was significant in three groups. Having benches, which is kind of interesting because you sit in benches. But, but if you have a bench, that means you're expecting people to walk to that bench. All right, so it's thinking about pedestrians. It's not something that you would put in for cars. You're thinking about people with benches. So a sidewalk, well that's good. We like sidewalks. A buffer. A between or, or a space between the sidewalk and the traffic. That could be a parked car or a planting strip. Um, uh, curb cuts, which are very important for older adults, you know, to have a, a ramp going down to the street. Also, mothers with strollers, they kind of like that. Um, that's, a, that's a good thing there. And so you see, where do, we, where do we have the most significance? Is with adults and with children. Not so much with adolescents. But when we, when we add all of these up, we have this grand score down at the bottom um, that just deals with active transport. So that means we didn't include these uh, uh, social uh, disorder items of graffiti and building maintenance. So if we look at the total score of just these 15 items, it's significant for all four age groups. So if you design um, a, a streetscape or a neighborhood for pedestrians, it works across the age groups.
Um, and I will say, so one thing I didn't prepare for in this talk um, was that even though I'm in a city, we're in a uh, rural agricultural region. And uh, so in fact, there are, there's at least one scale like similar to this um, to assess the activity friendliness or pedestrian friendliness of rural areas and small towns. Um, and, and you'll be able to find that on our Active Living Research website. But in fact, we've used this in rural areas as well. Um, and the, the lo a longer version that talks more, uh, has more detail about the quality of the street and the, and the pedestrian facilities. So, so we do have some measures that can be used in rural areas. And so one, one thing I want to point out here is that uh, uh, the more, the, the higher the score on the MAPS Mini, the stronger the association or the more um, active transport there was. And so this is uh, with children and adolescents. The higher the score, the more the active transport. This is with adults and older adults. The higher the score, uh, the more the active transport. So uh, two messages there. One, now don't, no, uh, no matter where your uh, neighborhood is starting, you can improve it. And the second is, uh, if, you, if you really want a lot more people walking, you've got to make the streets a lot better. So if you just make a little bit of change, um, it's not, uh, you're not going to get so much outcome. Okay. Um, so what are the lessons uh, from this uh, little uh, uh, piece of the evidence? Both the design of cities and the design of streetscapes are important for physical activity for youth and adults. And more is better. All environments can be improved. And so the, the, these, uh, these data really talk about, uh, have implications for our zoning laws, for our transportation goals, and how much funding we put in uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, um, for how uh, the road design guidelines, for the measurement of active travel, and for parks funding. And so even though I didn't talk about parks, we find that parks are very important for uh, for physical activity, again, across, across all ages. So now, I uh, want to take this a step farther and look at income disparities in environments. So here are two walkable uh, streets. They're they mixed use. Um, they, they both have retail on the bottom and offices or, uh, or uh, residences up above, uh, but they look different. And they, they both have, uh, they're both relatively safe uh, street crossings. Um, but one, uh, this one looks more upscale, more affluent. You can tell by all the decorations and flowers, uh, which, which this one doesn't have. So we would call this um, a more uh, supportive uh, environment for physical activity, especially leisure activity. Um, and so this is an example of an environmental disparity. Um, and so we, we did a couple of studies. One, we, uh, we took a similar instrument and we observed uh, what kinds of environments are um, available uh, in, in parks or what kinds of facilities are available for physical activity in parks. And, uh, and we were expecting that we would find uh, more facilities in, higher, in parks in higher income neighborhoods. And, uh, but we found uh, a, a complex um, uh, findings here uh, that were different in Seattle and Baltimore regions. And in Seattle region, we found an unexpected pattern um, with, um, in some cases, uh, uh, there were uh, more activity facilities in the lower income parks. And we think that might be um, because uh, Seattle uh, or King County has a policy that um, the, the facilities they provide will be as good or better in low-income areas. And, and in fact, that's what we find. So we think that they've targeted investments in parks um, uh, for the most disadvantaged. Um, and so we consider that an equitable difference um, that gives some benefit to a, a neighborhood that would otherwise be considered disadvantaged and at higher risk for chronic disease. In the Baltimore region, we found uh, that 
we found what we expected, that the quality of parks was better in higher income. So, uh, okay, so keep, keep that in mind. We, we found these uh, regional differences. Now, th in this study, we looked at streetscapes. So we used the maps uh, 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 tool. And uh, again, we found, um, uh, we found complex uh, results. Low income and high racial ethnic minority neighborhoods had aesthetic and social features that made them less pedestrian friendly. All right, so uh, the aesthetics were poor, kind of like the picture I showed you just a minute ago. And the pedestrian features varied greatly uh, between and within uh, cities. So it wasn't so predictable. But here, here's the bottom line, really, for, for both of these. And we, we found in both studies that each city uh, had a unique environment. And the only way that you're going to be able to know what and whether you have environmental disparities in parks or streetscapes is you have to collect local data. You have to go look in your city or in your town um, to see if you have um, environmental disparities or not. Because it, uh, it wasn't uh, uniform findings across regions. It wasn't uh, uniform findings even uh, across types of neighborhoods, residential versus mixed use. OK. So that's a, uh, a recommendation to you to think about uh, finding ways of assessing your own communities for the healthfulness of the environments. Okay, now I want to feature some work done by uh, one of your local, uh, local um, uh, investigators and professionals. Um, this is, uh, I, I want to show a study uh, done by Jordan Carlson, uh, who's here. Jordan, uh, raise your hand. So uh, Jordan did his uh, graduate work in San Diego and now uh, works here at Children's Mercy Hospital. Um, uh, but this, uh, this study that he did fits into the theme that I, I want to give you. And this is about school practices and children's physical activity. Uh, and he studied kids in 100 elementary schools in San Diego uh, and uh, Seattle King County. And uh, so basically, th these kids, uh, there was no programs in these, in these schools. Uh, this is really a naturalistic study. We had accelerometer data on a bunch of kids, and so we looked to see what is happening in their schools. So that's what Jordan figured out, what is happening in these schools. And so we looked at um, five um, uh, uh, physical activity practices um, that we thought would be, uh, would be healthful, and, and we did find them to be healthful. And so it's having a, a, a certified physical education teacher, uh, providing a, a, at least 100 minutes a week of physical education, um, having recess supervised by a, a non-classroom teacher, providing more than 20 minutes per period of recess, and um, having uh, a, a lot of uh, students um, at, at recess. Um, so, so, uh, then, so we looked at the, the number of practices in each school, and we have plotted this here by the physical activity. So this is minutes of physical activity during the school day assessed by accelerometer. And um, so what you see is um, schools that had zero of these physical activity promoting practices had 20 minutes, the kids did on average 20 minutes of physical activity during school. The CDC would recommend that schools should be providing 30 minutes a day of the 60 minutes total for the day. And so, um, but if uh, the schools where they had four or five of these practices, the kids were doing 40 minutes a day, right? So well above the recommended 30 minutes. And again, this is not us going in and saying to the schools, you do these things. These are things that schools are already doing. So some of the schools are already doing those four or five practices. They're doing multiple things to help kids get active, and it's working. 
So this is an example of there's not one solution. PE alone or recess alone or activity breaks alone are not enough. So anyway, that's the, that's the lesson there. And I'm going to skip this one. Um, the last thing, I, uh, uh, just about the last thing I want to show you is a, 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 a literature review that we did. And uh, it's called The Strength of Obesity Prevention Interventions in Early Care and Education Settings. So now we're talking about preschoolers. And we reviewed 43 studies of obesity prevention, diet, and physical activity interventions. Uh, published over, uh, you know, recently, since the last review. And um, so uh, we quantified their obesity prevention interventions. Um, and um, they got a better score if they were changing environments and policies. Um, they got additional score if they involved parents. Um, they, they got not much of a score, a lower score, if they did a lot of one-time events or educational programs, um, um, and this is what we found. So the overall strength of intervention, the more they focused on environment and policies, um, uh, the intervention strength scores um, for diet and physical activity and combined interventions were correlated um, uh, above 0.3 with obesity, basically, BMI or, or, or body fat. And then the strength of parent engagement, the more they engage parents, added to this correlation. So if they only did educational interventions, um, then uh, you know, this, this did not uh, affect the obesity. But if they, uh, if they, the more they change the environment, the more they change their policies, and examples would be no sugar sweetened beverages, uh, no screen time uh, for these little kids, uh, several activity breaks, that sort of thing. The more they did that, um, that worked in reducing uh, uh, obesity. Okay, maybe this is the last one here. Um, uh, this is a, a huge study called um, uh, the Healthy, Healthy Community Study, um, where they examined 130 communities all, all across the country, and they oversampled high-risk um, uh, meaning low income, high minority, high risk for obesity. Um, and, they, and then they, they measured uh, 5,000 children. Um, and what they found was, and, and they did a, um, an intervention intensity score that was similar to what I just showed you uh, for the um, uh, early care and education. Um, and, and what they found was, that more diet, the more diet and physical activity behaviors that they targeted, the lower the BMI. So if they, if they targeted fruits and vegetables and uh, uh, sugary drinks and screen time and uh, physical activity at school and physical activity uh, um, uh, you know, in parks, um, uh, that was associated with lower BMI and lower waist circumference. So almost close to a um, one BMI unit, um, which is uh, certainly clinically, um, clinically relevant. So, the, um, so that means that uh, community efforts, like many of you, or maybe all of you, are involved with uh, here, um, uh, all across the country, were the more that they targeted more behaviors, uh, the more effective they were. Uh, unfortunately, I've, I've uh, heard some uh, presentations of additional data that they're in the process of publishing, and the, uh, there's a caveat here and, and a warning, and in that those results were primarily seen in uh, higher income and lower minority uh, communities. So they didn't see really improvements in lower income communities or high minority communities. So while overall these uh, interventions can be effective for the most at risk populations, they don't appear to be effective. So this is, uh, I think, uh, some sobering findings that um, me mean that we need to pay more attention to the disparities and targeting of interventions 
um, to the um, uh, communities at highest risk. Okay, so uh, now I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, wind up and I want to invite you to come to the activelivingresearch.org website. We have many um, resources for you. This is just a couple of examples of infographics. We also have um, uh, research briefs that summarize research in non-technical um, language um, uh, and, and uh, webinars and uh, uh, scientific articles and all of that sort of thing. So, um, okay, this is gonna be the end of my presentation. Um, so, uh, remember what you do now? Thank you. So, that's the end of my presentation, but now I want to do a, like a two minute activity break. So, I know we don't have much time. Um, so I, I learned, uh, so let's, let's keep standing and, and walk, if you can. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to move around just a little bit um, and do what's comfortable to you. Um, so I learned from an African dance teacher that in Africa they make dances up about anything, okay, about their daily life. So I figure we're in the middle of, I'm going to call it corn country. So, uh, so uh, let's make a dance out of corn. How about that? Uh, something you see every so often. So maybe the first thing we'll do, we'll, we'll say we've already uh, uh, plowed the fields, so we're gonna plant some corn. So we're walking down the row and let's plant some corn. Let's throw some out this way, throw some out that way. Behind the back, behind the back. Toss it way down the field, a little baseball with both hands. We'll just throw that corn everywhere. We want it growing everywhere. All right, and so now we're gonna, we're gonna wait, we're gonna do some exercise, and now the corn's grown. So we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta pick that corn, and we're gonna put it in a bag. No machines here, it's just us. So pick the corn, put it in the bag. Pick the corn, put it in the bag. Pick the corn, put it in the bag. Okay, and now we're gonna take that big old sack, and we're bent over, and we're gonna walk back to the house, and we're going to uh, cook ourselves up some corn. Okay, so that's how we do a corn dance. Thank you very much.